Did video kill the radio star? Yes, according to Trevor Horn. But the real question is, did the smartphone kill the consumer video camera? If your video camera is collecting dust, this video is for you. Stay tuned for more tips on getting the best possible video from your smartphone. This is Media Channels, a multimedia corp production, bringing you information about the latest media trends, helpful tutorials, and commentary on the digital world around you. Thank you for joining me for part two of how to use your smartphone for better photos and video. My name is Stuart Rathry over at Multimedia Corp. In this episode, I will show you how to get the most out of the video mode on your smartphone. These podcast episodes can be viewed on our Facebook page, YouTube, and listened to on various podcasting platforms, which are listed in the description or via our website at multimedia.ca forward slash media dash channels. And as a recap from the first part of our series, I talked about how to take better photos with your smartphone. This podcast included working with the small sensor size of your smartphone, holding the phone the right way, the rule of thirds, lighting, metering angles, perspectives, and background separation. Most of these tips will also work for video mode, so if you have not seen the episode, please go and watch it first. Now, video on a smartphone can be good, but only if it is done the correct way. There are a few different techniques that you should be aware of to help you pump out better videos. So tip number one in this list is holding the phone horizontally and not vertically. Now I know phones are meant to be, meant to be hold vertically because it is more intuitive and it does fit better in the hand, but in reality it does produce a worse result if you're trying to take video with it. So do the little extra work required to get better video People will thank you for it in the end, unless you're on Instagram, which I'll explain later. Uh, the real problem though is the manufacturers in their quest to create a smart device that does everything for everybody. What they really ended up doing is creating a device that doesn't do one thing really well, but does everything in a mediocre, mediocre way in reality. It has become the Swiss army knife of the digital media world and according to the global stat stats counter 60 percent of all devices that are viewing consumable content is mobile in nature and that includes tablets as well so that means that 40 percent of the people who are viewing video or websites are still using desktops game consoles or tvs for viewing these particular videos so you don't want to leave them out in the dust. It'll not to be a pretty scene. So let's be realistic though. Watching vertical video on anything other than a smartphone typically sucks if you're sharing it on with various people really. Uh, it only works on smartphones because obviously you're not gonna be rotating your monitor 90 degrees in most cases unless you want to do something really funky or have one of those monitors that actually does rotate 90 degrees uh, but for myself anyways I find that watching vertical video on anything other than a smartphone tends to give me a headache and I have a hard time focusing on vertical videos because it's such a narrow field of view and our eyes they actually have roughly 180 degrees of vision horizontally while only 150 degrees vertically. So that's why horizontal horizontal videos are just better overall. So it was always meant to be horizontal and this dates back to the original days of film. Uh, Instagram developers, however, might want you to think that vertical video is the future, but I'm thinking this is just a really long fad and this is my opinion only, but I'm hoping it is because phones, they do change over time. I mean, if you remember the BlackBerry, I mean, they had square screens. So as phones develop over time, hopefully we'll get a phone that will fit better in the hand and will actually take, make it easy for people to take regular video. So my hope is that 
in 10 years from now, it'll be a forgotten memory. Maybe not, but we'll see what happens. And let's be honest, when you're framing up a person for a video, we really don't need to see their knees. We don't need to see their feet, the lower part of their body. The interesting part of any video is really going to be the scene itself. Uh, and that usually includes the upper part of the body if there's a person in it. And usually the face. Usually. Unless you're trying to go for something really funky, like you're trying to take a video of something really tall, then you may get away with vertical video in that situation. Although when you do shoot vertical video, you tend to lose a large chunk of the context of the scene. So when you are likely to end up with a huge amount of sky, ceiling, grass, you know, you're going to end up with a lot of floor if you're inside. And these are very unimportant details when you're shooting video. I don't need to see the sky, a big chunk of the sky or a big chunk of the grass. I know there's grass there. I can see a little bit of the grass maybe in the background. Okay, so I don't need to see a lot of grass in the scene. So the trick is to use the background to your advantage and not overwhelm the person viewing it with unnecessary details. So before you do start your, start your video, I recommend to turn the rotation lock off before starting recording because if you don't, you may end up with an improperly rotated video. Not all social media platforms and phones will be able to rotate on the fly. So that's why it's important to turn the rotation lock off. And one of the funniest things I've seen regarding vertical video is there's a skit on, there's a puppet skit on the internet called Vertical Video Syndrome. And it's on YouTube, so if you want to get a chuckle, it's uh, quite funny, actually. Uh, go check it out on YouTube, and uh, I'm sure you'll understand what I'm talking about. So tip number two is studying your video and using a monopod, okay? So when you're taking video, it's a lot harder than taking a photo to keep it steady, and you'll notice this. There's a lot of videos on the Internet that are not steady whatsoever. So in the same way as a photograph... You know, oops, take your, take your elbows, you know, press them in into your chest, you know, the same way as, as a photograph, you know, kind of like this, you know, this is a good way to keep it steady if you have nothing else uh, that you can steady with, okay? So you can try that. Another technique is to extend your left arm and angle your hand towards your body with your right hand on the phone and rest the other part of the phone on your elbow, okay? So I'm gonna show you. So you can go like this, okay? I'm just gonna grab my phone. So you can kinda go do something like this, and you can see it around the microphone. And if you do this, you have a much, a much nicer steady shot. And you could try it out for yourself. You, you'll find out that it works quite well, actually. The other thing that you may be able to do this is for someone who does a lot of video and not just casually get yourself a monopod such as something like this it has a with a video head make sure you get a video head and a cell phone holder like this as well okay the advantage of this is it can stand up and uh, get yourself a nice steady shot that way and if you're moving around the other benefit to this is you can take this and you can kind of put it over your shoulder like this. And you wouldn't believe how steady this is. This becomes a very steady shot. People won't even notice that you're, you're hand holding it or even uh, using a device in this case. And you can also go like this and tilt it up and down like that. So if you wanted to get uh, something very steady as well. So steady to your video is one of the most important things into improving the video on the smartphone, okay? So that was the monopod. And tip number three is more of a technical thing. It is working with the video dimensions on the application that you're using. So this particular uh, setting is called resolution and not all phones support it, unfortunately. Uh, but resolution is basically the amount of data, data or the pixels in the particular scene per frame. So common resolutions are 
4K, which is 4, 3,840 pixels wide by, I believe it's uh, 2,048 or something to that effect. And then you have full HD, which is 1920 pixels wide by 1080, and that's how you get the 1080p. And then you got regular or standard HD, which is 1280 pixels wide by 720. So that's where you get the 720p from. So the advantage of 4K video is that you get better quality video overall, but it takes up a lot more space on your phone. You may not get very long clips. It is good for short clips, however. There is one trick that may help you though. Um, if you find yourself in a lower light situation and you find that there's a lot of noisy artifacts or the video quality looks a little grainy or a little odd, you can try lowering the resolution from full 4K to something such as full HD or even regular HD. Um, now, what will one of two things will happen when you do this, depending on your phone. So the phone in probably the majority of the cases will basically crop the image. It'll actually just take a small part of the sensor. Okay, it'll take a small part of the sensor and then sample the picture from that. And that's actually not gonna help in low light situations. So if your phone does that, it's not gonna help you. But if you have a particular phone or an application that allows what is called pixel binning or what I call resampling, it'll actually take two or three pixels from that full sensor on your phone and use that to basically combine them into one pixel. So this will this can actually help in low light situations. So if your phone allows that, uh, try that and see if you get a better quality low light um, video. Okay, so try it out on your phone and see if it works. Um, you have nothing to lose in that particular case. Uh, so when it comes to resolution, in most cases, you're probably going to want to use full HD for now until cell phone sizes increase. I mean, you, unless you have like 64 or 128 gigabytes on your phone, then you're probably going to want to stick with full HD just for the sake of saving space. And this brings me to tip number four, which is focusing properly. Uh, it's not something really we have to worry about too much anymore, but most phones allow you to focus while recording simply by touching the screen. So if you touch a screen while it's recording, it should fix the focus if there was a focusing issue. So this is a no brainer. Uh, most phones do autofocus pretty nicely these days. So it's not something you probably have to worry about, but if it does, you just have to touch the screen to get the focus again. Tip number five is understanding what ISO is to help the quality of your video. So ISO is basically just a gain adjustment. It adjusts the brightness of the scene. It is very similar to the volume button on your phone. So all you're doing is amplifying the signal and that's how ISO works. So it amplifies the signal that is coming into the sensor that is already there. So if your camera app has an ISO setting, generally set it to a lower number, 100 or 200 or however low it can possibly go, will in most cases reduce the noise in the photo if you have enough light, okay? Now, if you do set the ISO too low and you don't have a properly exposed video or not enough light, it's too dark in the scene, uh, then you're going to have to go higher with the ISO in that particular case. So a lower ISO is useful if you have a scene that has a lot of light and a higher ISO is useful if you have a scene that is lower in light. So that's something you can play with manually. Uh, there's also an ISO auto setting on the particular app I use, um, which seems to work. But if I really need to push the limits of low light situation, then I will do it manually. Tip number six is the exposure compensation feature. It's another technical thing that you won't find in mo most smartphone apps. But the exposure compensation feature will increase or darken the scene. Now this works a little differently 
than the ISO feature because it'll actually adjust the manual parts of your phone, the lens and the sensor, rather than doing a software sort of a gain adjustment. So you may, if you do increase the exposure too much, you may introduce a blur if you have low light. Um, and the exposure compensation feature on most phones will, will be represented by plus and minus signs that are along a sliding scale bar. Okay, so look for that if you have it. If not, you may have to download another app for that. And again, just be aware that the blurs or ghosting could happen while recording if the exposure is too high. And if that starts to happen, or if you start to see the effect that you may even see here is where my hand starts to blur a little bit, then you could try lowering the exposure. Uh, if you find that your scene is too dark, again, just try increasing the exposure to see if that helps. Tip number seven is understanding the white balance. Now, this isn't a default option on most smartphone apps, but if you do have an app that has white balance feature, it's something you could start to play around with. It will help you get more accurate colors for your video. So white balance is usually expressed in Kelvin or K. Um, and there's various reference points for the type of lighting that you're in. So 2000 Kelvin or K is the same is basically the same as candlelight and it'll have a very reddish orange tint to it 3500k is an orange tint less red in it and it's what you most typical light bulbs will be running at even if you have led or the cfl type bulbs they'll be normally running at 3500 it's a very warm color and that's why it's used for home lighting typically and then you have 4000 Kelvin or K, which is typically for fluorescent lighting. Uh, most offices will have that particular, and it's a little more cold than and, and less warm than the 3500. And then you get into the higher values of 5500 K, which is the same as daylight. And it tends to have a teal or blue tint to it, and it starts to become a really cold sort of a image. And then you have on the even higher extreme, you have 7,000 Kelvin or K, and it's basically overcast or blue sky. So you have a very bluish sort of image to it. And the approach you want to take to getting the proper white balance is to match the white balance to the lighting that you're in. So if you're outside on a very sunny day, you probably want to be around 5,500 K. If you're indoors in candlelight, you want to try to be around 2,000 Kelvin. And if you have that setting on your phone, you can just simply set it to that particular Kelvin rating. Or depending on the phone or the application, it may actually describe what the light scenes are. So you might actually have something like candlelight or fluorescent lighting or some other descriptor to help you identify what kind of light you're in. Um, if you do find yourself in mixed lighting, however, I would use the brightest light source source as your reference. So if you're outside um, and you're trying to get the right white balance, it doesn't make sense to set it to candlelight or 2000 Kelvin, even if you do have a candle beside you. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, so use the brightest light source as your reference. Uh, and then if you really want to get into the extreme, you can also buy white balancing cards. They're special calibrated cards that you can buy. They're not very they're not very cheap either. They're, I mean, I bought a set of used ones for I think forty or fifty dollars, but uh, they're calibrated to usually to gray, white, and sometimes other warmer colors as well. Uh, but for most people, this is overkill for casual use, and unless you're going to be doing this on a daily basis where you're uploading videos to YouTube or something, then it's probably not for you. Okay. This brings me to tip number eight, which is understanding frame the frame rate setting, okay? So I'd say about probably half of all smartphones have this setting already built into the default application, and the frame rate refers to 
how often a full image is captured per second, okay? So the higher the frame rate you have, the smoother the video will tend to look at the cost of sacrificing space on your smartphone. Uh, in Canada and in the US, we use a standard, and it's been a standard for a very long time, it's called NTSC, and its fr standard frame rates are 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 48 frames per second, 60 frames per second, and sometimes even 100 frames per second, okay? Uh, in European countries and other countries, they typically use a standard called PAL or PAL, and they run generally run at 25 frames per second and 50 frames per second. So if you're buying a camcorder, I mean, this probably doesn't apply to you, but if you're buying a camcorder in the European Union, you'll notice that the frame rate settings are actually different than what you would get in North America or, I guess, South America. Okay. There is one thing you can do with the frame rate setting that may help you out is if you find yourself indoors and you find yourself that there's banding or a subtle discolored bars that are flowing up and down the screen of the smartphone. Now, I don't see this too often on smartphones anymore, but it may still happen. And this is called banding. And banding, banding is generally happens if you're in fluorescent lighting or in incandescent lighting that is flickering. Um, it may be a defective bulb or it may just be a poorly designed bulb. Uh, in most cases, your eyes won't notice this, but the camera will tend to pick it up if there is an inc inconsistent flickering with the with the light bulb. Uh, and this actually happens as in photography as well if you're using a mirrorless camera. So this effect happens because all light bulbs r they run at a certain fre frequency, and this is usually based on the electrical frequency that's coming into your home or office. And this frequency is usually either 60 hertz if you're in North America or 50 hertz if you're in Europe somewhere or other countries. And it really depends on the quality of the light bulb. Sometimes you have frequencies that are running at a lot higher refresh rate. And that's what actually it's called. It's called hertz or refresh rate. It's how many times that particular light bulb will turn itself on and off within um, one second or 60 and in North America typically it's 60 times a second for incandescent so you may not believe me but there's a simple test you can do is try looking at a light bulb okay don't look directly at it but try looking at a light bulb and off to the side a little bit without focusing on the light bulb you actually may notice a flicker there. And that flicker is actually what's happening is the light bulb is turning itself on and off 60 times per second. That's a refresh, okay? So give it a go. You'll see what I mean by that. Uh, if you find yourself in that situation where you find banding and there's some flickering going on, you can try adjusting the frame rate, then this may help. So you can try adjusting it to 60 frames per second or which is 60 hertz or 30 hertz uh, or 30 frames per second to see if that helps. Uh, smartphones aren't the greatest at adjusting the shutter setting or other settings that may help alleviate this issue, but uh, try just changing the frame rate first and see if that helps. Uh, when it comes to frame rate, uh, video sharing sites such as YouTube typically accept frame rates from 24 frames per second all the way up to 60 frames per second. So if you're on a slow internet connection and you're trying to upload a video somewhere, um, stick to the lower frame rates. You'll just upload a lot quicker and more reliably. Uh, if you do have a faster connection, you could try uploading at 60 frames per second. 30 frames per second seems to be the norm and is more natural. Uh, for electronic devices, I find anyways. But if you're in the cinema or some other place, then 24 is is the go-to frame rate. Uh, TV shows and commercials, they'll typically use uh, 24 frames per second and, and sometimes 30 frames per second. Typically, you're only gonna see 60 frames per second on YouTube or smartphones or any other video sharing applications. Uh, so probably sticking to 30 frames per second for the sake of space is what you want to do. This is brings me to tip number nine. 
is uh, bitrate and changing the bitrate to get a higher quality video. Um, so the bitrate can affect the quality of your video in a very significant way. Uh, I haven't seen any default application camera applications on smartphones that allow you to change the bitrate, but on the various add-on applications you can download free from either Google Play Store or from the Apple Store, you may, well, you probably find an application that allows you to change the bitrate. Uh, so do that, get yourself a third party app, and basically the higher bitrate, how it offers the higher video quality is in the sense that it'll, every time you take a video, what it's actually doing is it's compressing the video, every, it's compressing every frame of the video so that it can save space. Now, you're not going to find that smartphones, in they really want to save space on your smartphone. So the default applications will tune down the bitrate to keep it, everything nice and easy and simple for uploading and sharing on various social media sites. But if you want to get a high quality video, go into the bitrate settings on your phone. If you can find it, it's usually in the gear setting. And see if you can find a bitrate that is maybe 18 megabits per second, okay? So 18 megabits per second uh, is a fairly high rate, I would say, for a smartphone. If you're shooting at uh, 1080p, uh, you're going to find that the quality will go up dr dramatically in those uh, particular situations if, if you're in a good lighting situation. I'm thinking that most smartphones are probably recording at 4, 5, 6, or 7 megabits per second. Um, a lot of uh, consumer video cameras will start start recording at around 18 megabits per second and go all the way up to 50 megabits per second or, or higher. Um, but then you get into territory where you're spending a lot of money on a camera. Uh, when it comes to bit rate, uh, the compression artifacts, you'll notice them a lot. So you might notice what is almost like a JPEG artifact, which is basically your video will look a little blocky and it'll start having these weird looking streams through the, the video or these little colors that just pop up out of nowhere that don't quite seem like they belong there. So that's increasing the bit rate will help help to decrease that. Um, and if you're live streaming, you'll places um, social media networks such as Facebook live will only allow you to stream at 720p and four megabits per second. So I don't know if you knew that. This is why Facebook streaming quality isn't really that great to begin with is because they have a hard cap on what you can do with that. Now it's probably because they know that people are on their smartphones and they may not be having the greatest bandwidth to be able to upload videos directly to their service. So they probably nip it down and keep it nice and simple for people so they're not experiencing a lot of dropouts. Uh, if you're on your cell phone and you're streaming to Facebook Live, your data plan may also be restricting your bit rate as well. Uh, and if that's happening, then you're going to notice that your video quality just keeps going lower and lower and it's just going to look like it was shot on a video camera from the 80s or even the 70s in all likelihood. So the only way to really improve that if you're streaming to Facebook lies is to buy a third party streaming device that attaches to your phone and then at least you can get the maximum quality that you can out of Facebook. If you're on YouTube, they allow a lot higher streaming quality than Facebook does and at 1080p and probably even 4K, I think. Don't quote me on that. Tip number 10 to getting a better video is actually to get better audio. Okay? So, Having good audio is just as important. And the reason why is because if you have decent video but nobody can hear what's going on or if the audio is muddled or otherwise not very good, people are going to get frustrated very quickly and probably won't be watching the video. So to get better uh, audio in your video, get yourself an external microphone. It's very the very simple thing to do. 
So the first thing you need though, is if you're gonna be getting yourself an external microphone, is you're probably gonna need an adapter like this, okay? So this is a Y adapter, okay? It even, think some of the older phones I had, I think even came with this, this particular one I bought off, I think I bought this one off Amazon. It's basically just a Y adapter. So you plug it into your headphone port, okay? And it has, it has the headphone jack on one side and the microphone jack on the other side, okay? So go get yourself this adapter if you're gonna buy yourself an external microphone. Uh, other electronic shops and re local retailers such as Best Buy probably have them as well. I'm not 100% certain, but I mean, they are around. They're not hard to find, okay? And they only cost about six or $7 Canadian, okay? Uh, what I actually did to plug into this particular adapter is I bought myself a little microphone. It's actually a computer microphone, okay? It's a little lapel microphone like this. Uh, you see, it's very uh, very tiny, okay? You can, fit, you can fit in your pocket and it just has the cord that you can plug in to the microphone jack, okay? So this microphone was $15 off of, or $20 off of a computer website. Uh, but one thing that I'm gonna stress, I can't stress this enough, is if you're gonna plug a microphone into your phone, make sure that you don't plug in any high-end microphones directly into your phone or you may damage your phone, okay? So if you're gonna buy a microphone, get yourself either, if you're gonna plug it directly in, get yourself a computer mic because the computer mic uses the same type of voltages and connectors and whatnot as your smartphone, okay? So you don't have to worry about your microphone, a little microphone like this damaging your phone. Uh, but do check when you do buy, that make sure that is actually designed for your computer or specifically for a phone, because if it's not, then it may, you may damage it. And we don't want anyone coming back and saying, oh, my phone was damaged because I plugged this, this really nice microphone into it with various adapters and I made it work somehow, okay? So go and get yourself a computer microphone, preferably. I mean, there are specific microphones that you can get that are designed specifically for the phone as well. Um, there are two types of microphones you can get. Uh, the one is a dynamic microphone, and the other is a condenser microphone. Okay, so I'm just going to explain the difference. So dynamic mics require you to be really close to the mic for good audio, and it is typically more suitable for noisy environments and live performances, okay? You will usually see dynamic microphones on stages and event centers such as hotels, and you will notice them right away because they usually have a metal mesh around the top of them. Uh, they tend to be more robust and they can be, dr I wouldn't recommend dropping them, but they tend to be dropped and still able to work, okay? So they have, uh, usually made of heavy metal and whatnot. Condensers, on the other hand, are far far more sensitive, okay? So what I'm talking on right now is actually a condenser microphone. I know I'm really close to the mic. It's only because I want to get the best audio that I can. But condenser microphones will actually pick up the audio from far away. So see, I can still go far away and you're still picking me up. And I can go back closer and you'll still be picking up the, the audio. Okay, so typically, condenser mics are what you see in studios, uh, halls. Uh, most lapel mics are going to be uh, condensers. Sometimes they sit on top of broadcast cameras or what they call directional or shotgun microphones. Usually if you have CCTV or another news service, you'll see they have these long microphones on the top of the camera. Those are condensers. Uh, so if you're trying to get more of a background audio, you probably want to go want to go with a condenser mic. But if you're strictly doing interviews or if you're talking to people, a uh, dynamic microphone would probably be good in that situation. Uh, another option is you could try to get yourself a Bluetooth headset uh, and skip all the cabling. Okay. Uh, I generally find the Bluetooth headsets don't have very good audio quality, but you know, if you just want something simple, try that. You know, it'd probably be better than nothing. I mean, obviously, it's going to be better than having the built-in microphone on your phone. There's also devices 
that you can get for your iOS devices your uh, that are called iRigs or an iRig-like device. And basically, those devices, they're not very expensive. I believe they're about $60 to $70 Canadian. You plug them in to professional microphones, such as a shotgun microphone or a condenser microphone, or um, condenser such as this Rode microphone that I'm talking on right now, or uh, you know, a dynamic microphone, one that you would see on stage. So those types of devices usually have a volume control built in, and they're powered externally. So you don't have to worry about wrecking your phone, plugging in a decent microphone into it. And it has another, it has usually a head headphone output on it as well. And the last aspect of getting better audio for your video, I'm going to say, is just bef before you do anything serious, just monitor the audio around you. So just do a quick recording, okay? Play it back and see what's going on in the background, audio-wise, okay? See what's going on in the background. See if there's any weird noises coming from anywhere. See if there's any distortions or anything like that. Uh, get yourself a pair of headphones if it's a noisy environment. You know, you could just put the get a couple, get a earbuds from your that probably came with your phone and put them in your ears and just see what's going on before you start recording. You get a better sense of your surroundings. This will help you get a better, better video in the long run. Try it out. Tip number 11. Okay, this one's a little bit more technical. And it's called the histogram setting. Now, you're not going to see that. I don't think any smartphone apps have this default. But if you do download a, another application, another cam camera application, you'll find that it probably has a histogram setting. And the histogram setting can be used to determine what parts of your scene are underexposed or overexposed. So just looking at the screen is not always the greatest way to tell if you have a decently bright or dark image. Uh, so once you do turn on the Instagram setting, you will literally see a graph on the screen. And sometimes it'll be re represented by three graphs, uh, red, green, and blue, the primary colors of light. So turn it on, you'll see a graph. And on the left side of the graph, you're typically going to see a bunch of lines going up and down on the graph and that will actually represent the darker parts of the scene. If you move to the right side of the graph, you will those particular points on the graph will represent the brighter areas of the scene. Okay? So the goal with the histogram is to try to evenly distribute the points in the graph as flat as possible or as elevated or as low across the entire graph. So if you see that any lines, if there's a big chunk of the points on the graph that are either on the left side or on the right side of the graph, that indicates that either the image is way too dark or the image is way too light. And it'll result in a poor quality video. If you see nothing in the middle of the graph, then you're in real trouble and you need to adjust your settings or do something differently to get a better exposed video, okay? So again, try to even out the graph when you're taking the picture. And if you move around with the histogram turned on, you'll notice immediately notice that the graph, the points on the graph will change with how you're moving the phone around. So if you point at a light and then point at a dark area, you'll notice right away that it changes quite a bit. That was histograms, okay? And tip number 12 is basically uh, just some practical tips for Facebook Live. I know a lot of people are into Facebook Live, so here are some practical tips. And actually, some of these tips are direct from the Facebook uh, website on live streaming. So it, on the website, it says, before you go live, announce it beforehand. And the reason for this is because it can be awkward to suddenly go live without any context on why you're going live. So if you just go live and all of a sudden there's a scene of a park or something, you may not be, the people watching may be like going, oh, what, what's going on? Or they may just kind of be like surprised. So they might click on it, 
view it for a few seconds and click off it right away because they're not sure what's going on. They may just, maybe just think it was a mistake or something. Uh, another tip straight from the Facebook Live website is to properly open and close your live stream. So just having a short intro and closing words will make a huge difference in uh, taking video. So if you're taking a video of your kid, uh, say, hi, this is my kid. I'm just taking a video and this is what they're doing. And then when you finish it off, say, okay, bye for now. You know, something like that. It just gives that personal um, attention and approach to your video. Uh, another tip from the website is obviously is to make sure you're on either either a good Wi-Fi or 4G, 3G connection. The better the connection you have to the internet, the better the quality of the video will be. To a point, if you're on Facebook Live, so uh, try to get into a location that has decent internet connection. It'll help also with preventing random dropouts or clicks or weird artifacts during the video. And this tip is strictly my tip. Uh, so anytime you're shooting a video and it's going to be shared with more than just your immediate family, you know, this is the tip I like to tell everyone, whether it's for designing websites or video. It doesn't matter what it is, writing a story. There's five things that you should do in every video, okay? And I call it the W5 tip because there's a TV show on on uh, CBC, which has been around for ever and a day as far as I'm concerned, uh, called W5. And it stands for basically who you are, what you are doing, when you're doing it, where you are doing it, and why you're doing it, okay? So W5. So in your video, tell everybody who you are, tell everybody what you're doing, okay? Tell everybody when you're doing it, if that applies in that particular situation. Tell everyone where you're doing it, and w tell everyone why you're doing it, all right? So those five things you should be doing in every video if it's anything other than very, very casual use for your immediate family okay so that basically wraps up the tips list and just be aware that these are not all hard and fast rules but do play around and be a little creative to see what works for you and your phone because every phone is different unfortunately so what what may work for my phone may not work for your phone but try it out and see what happens so this concludes this episode of how to use your cell phone for photography and video and I would like to thank you for watching and listening. For more of these videos, don't forget to like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel using the icon in the left top left corner, or follow us on Twitter. You can also listen to these episodes on various podcasting platforms, which are listed in the description or via our website at multimedia.ca forward slash media dash channels. Also, if you have any other tips or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. Don't forget to keep an eye out for part three of this mini-series where I will be going into the real world and putting these tips into practice. Part three will be released exclusively on YouTube to start because of the practical nature of the video. There will be a lot of sort of tutorial things going on. So do look out for it on the YouTube channel and to all my people kind, have yourself a good afternoon and don't let Trudy get you down.